Today I'm going to be talking about the history and future of the UK state pension. Now, people tend to think that pensions are a reasonably recent invention, but there's history of state pensions even in ancient Greece, going back to 300 BC. And even in England, there are types of state pensions that were payable even in the 1300s to people for military service, for civil servants, and for a whole range of other services to the government. But it wasn't until the late 18th century that anybody really talked about a universal state pension, and then it became a topic of conversation in both the UK and France. Indeed, the civil service pensions developed in both of these countries through the 19th century. But it wasn't until 1889 in Germany that we saw the first universal state pension that was introduced by Bismarck. Now, the UK wasn't long behind, and a state pension was introduced here in 1909. But this was a means-tested pension, and it was only receivable from age 70. A full universal state pension in the UK wasn't introduced until 1948. And this pension is the one that we're all familiar with, payable from age 65 for men and from age 60 for women. Now, those are the current state pension ages, but they are going to be increasing very soon. Already, the state pension age from women has started to increase to bring it into line with that for men. For both men and women, it's going to be increasing to age 66, then 67, and possibly even to 68. And beyond that, who knows? Now, one of the key reasons for this increase in the state pension age is the increase in life expectancy. People are living longer. And if people are living longer, then we need to pay their pensions for longer. So the pension gets more expensive, and a solution is to pay it from a later date to increase the state pension age. And this isn't just a UK problem. Increasing longevity is happening around the world. So this is something which many countries are having to face. But increasing longevity is only part of the issue with the state pension. The UK state pension is a pay-as-you-go pension. Now what this means is that the pensions that are paid are funded through the taxes of those people working. When people work now, a part of the tax that they pay goes to pay the pensions of people who have already retired. So it's not just a function of how many people are retired, it's also a function of how many people are working. And this is where there's a real issue. In the UK, the fertility rate has fallen to below two children per woman. And again, this isn't just an issue for the UK, this is a global issue. Fertility rates have been falling around the world. Now what this means is that the number of people who are coming into the workforce to pay taxes has been falling. In other words, workforces as a proportion of retired population have been shrinking. One way we can combine this information is to look at the old age dependency ratio. Now this is the number of people who are retired divided by the number of people who are still working, or at least of working age. And the old age dependency ratio has been rising steadily in the UK for a number of years. But there are many countries in a worse position than the UK when it comes to the old age dependency ratio, but also, interestingly, some that are better. For example, if we look at Japan, Japan has had rapidly increasing longevity for many decades and also has a very low fertility rate. What this means is that the working population is very small compared to the retired population. Germany is much better. But what's really interesting is that those countries that seem to have quite low old age dependency ratios, in particular countries like Canada and Australia. Now, Canada and Australia both have similar levels of life expectancy to the UK. They've got similar levels of fertility to the UK, but they have significantly lower old age dependency ratios. So what's the reason for this? Well, the answer is quite simple, net migration. If you look at the United States, but in particular, Canada and Australia, they've had very strong net immigration for a number of years. Essentially, they've been importing a workforce to keep that workforce young, to keep that workforce large, particularly as a proportion of the retired population. So one way to solve the problem of an aging population is to keep it younger by importing more people. Now, after the Brexit vote and the concerns in this country around immigration, it seems less likely that we're going to have a similar situation here. So, perhaps the only solution is to continue to increase the state pension age. But I think there's a bit of an issue with this. 
The problem is that if you increase the state pension age, then everybody will receive their state pension later. But not everybody's life expectancy is the same. On this slide here, what we can see is the differences in life expectancy for different socioeconomic groups. Now, as we can see, life expectancy for all socioeconomic groups has been increasing over the last few decades. But life expectancy for the richest, which, for the avoidance of doubt, is the top line, has been consistently higher than the life expectancy for the least well-off, which is the bottom line. So if we are planning on increasing the state pension age ever more, what this essentially means is that it becomes decreasingly likely that the least well-off will even live to receive a state pension. Now, whilst some people are particularly keen to have the state pension as a universal benefit, it seems perverse to increase the state pension age just so that the best off, the people with the most money, can continue to receive even more money from the state. In fact, a solution to this problem of increasing longevity and reduced fertility might be to go back to the solution we had in 1909, and that is to have means testing. If we had means testing, if we had a situation where only those that really needed the state pension received the state pension, then we might not have to increase the state pension age. In fact, we might even be able to reduce the state pension age such that those people who really needed it would be able to receive it. But it's even worth thinking beyond this. Over the last few decades, retirement has become much less of an event and much more of a process. As such, it makes sense, I think, to integrate the state pension with more broader issues around social security, such that people can have a basic level of income, whether they're working, or whether they're retired, or whether they're transitioning from one to the other. And the best way to be able to fund this is to make sure that those people who really need it get it, and those people that don't really need it don't receive the estate benefits. So thank you very much, and I hope you found that interesting.